we are going to look at Psalm 139 this morning. So you can open up to Psalm 139. That's going to be our primary text. So the Queen of England, most of you have seen that the Queen of England, that is the UK's longest reigning monarch, died this week. She was 96 years old. Apparently she was still working as of Tuesday, and I think she passed away on Thursday. I think I'm getting that right. I mean, at this point, she was a bit more of a figurehead than a truly governing queen, we could say, but um, it's interesting with the monarchy, and I am not from England or from the United Kingdom, but it's uh, for some, the monarchy is something that they resent. And there are many, many others that really adored Queen Elizabeth. Um, For most, she would have been the only monarch that they knew in their lifetime. And many likely felt, as she was often in the news and people would just know a lot about her life, there are probably a lot of people that actually felt that in one sense they did know her. Um... Even some Americans might have felt that way. You know, well, I watched The Crown, so I must really know the Queen. Um, And I'm sure the Queen had met thousands of her own citizens, but though many would have felt as if they knew her, they actually didn't. Um, She certainly only actually knew and had an intimate connection with a very small fraction of the population of UK citizens and what their lives actually contained over their over this 70 year which is amazing this 70 year stretch as queen i think sometimes we imagine god a little bit like a british monarch um he's as if he's more of a divine figurehead than one that actually governs everyday life. Maybe we feel some affection for him, but it's like having this affection for this, again, divine figurehead that sits in some royal palace, some heavenly royal palace, somewhere out there, detached from our on-the-ground life. And we're told... You know, preachers, and certainly Randy seems to tell me that he has some sort of affection for me, but maybe that feels detached, untouchable, out of reach. How could the God of the universe possibly even be aware of me? Does his eye ever truly glance my way? Doesn't he have more important things to do? So as we work through, we're in this series on the prayers of the Bible. As we work through some of these prayers, um, and as I've said each time that it's just a, a very small sampling, I've chosen three psalms as a sampling of the prayers of David. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Psalm 51, which we could say is a prayer of confession. Uh, last week, if you happen to be at the Labor Day service last week down in Morris, um, our joint community service, I did a brief overview of Psalm 86, which is a psalm in which David looks to God in his neediness. And today we'll consider, as I said, Psalm 139, a psalm in which David prayerfully ponders the vastness and the wonder of God And then how that actually pertains to him personally. So this is another aspect of prayer. This this meditating on and taking account of the marvels of God. And then thinking about as you do that, as you meditate in prayer on the marvels of God, what the implications are for your own life in light of who God is. So this psalm is one that some of you may know. It's, it's a pretty well-known psalm of David. Again, it would have been directed uh, to music in his day. Psalm 139, and we'll just read through these 24 verses. David says, O Lord, you'll notice that's capitalized, that's Yahweh. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. 
Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me, or it could be concerning me, are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand when I awake I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God. Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I've mentioned plenty of times before um, the fact, and I, and I do this, I do this not to be con- as, as much to be condemning, but just for proper perspective, that we live in a very individualistic culture. And we're in a culture that is prone even to celebrate narcissism. Um, And it's hard to see that sometimes and easy to miss because we're fish in water. Uh, We celebrate narcissism even in our leaders. We somehow raise up these people that are very narcissistic and we say, oh, that's a really good leader. This has unfortunately become the norm of our society. And it inevitably, and we need to see this, it inevitably seeps into the fabric of the Western church. For Americans, our our go-to mode is to see everything through an individualistic lens. Uh, My first thought in each matter tends to be, how does it affect me? How does it pertain to me? So in terms of the Christian faith, we tend to do the same. We tend to see our faith journey, and we tend to see our worship and we, we tend to um, understand the Bible through a Western individualistic lens. And in contrast, many other cultures do not do this. Uh, many other cultures see first through the lens of community. And see how things affect the community is primary over how things affect the individual. And the idea then is how if the individual prospers, then the community prospers I'm sorry, the individual prospers only as the community prospers. And typically, it's more of this Eastern lens that the Bible is written through. This Eastern lens of the good of the community when it comes to God's people of faith. But even in this... If we were to then throw the pendulum all the way on the other side and and imagine that God only thinks of and sees and deals with groups of people, maybe in broad, broad terms and broad strokes, maybe even to the neglect of the individual, that too would be 
a great mistake. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible does show that God is deeply concerned with his salvation community and how everything that the individual does, how it, it plays and affects the community for good and for bad. But he is also just as deeply concerned with each individual that comprises it. And he does that in perfect balance. So Psalm 139, really, we could say, is a very personal psalm. One that does go from the broad, from the broad and the big and the big group and the and the, the community, and all of a sudden zeroes into the importance of God focusing on the one. It's a prayer that marvels at the transcendent God of all the universe, but but within the framework of the fact that he is literally mindful and present to each one of us. Derek Kidner writes, all small thoughts that we may have of God are magnificently transcended by this psalm. Yet for all its height and depth, it remains intensely personal from first to to last. The author Michael Wilcox says that if you were to look at this, this prayerful psalm in four, four sections, he says you will simply see that God knows me, that God surrounds me, that God has made me, and that God tests me. In the first six lines of the prayer, you could, it's as if David is hyper aware of God's infinite knowledge, that what we call omniscience, that God is all knowing, infinite in his knowledge. But, but it goes beyond that. It's like David is hyper aware that God has an absolute knowledge of him, that God knows him. And not just from a distance, but up close. And maybe we could say even uncomfortably so. God knows his ways. Every way. He knows his coming and his going. He knows his ways, whether they're public or private. He knows his ways, whether they're grand or mundane. He knows all of his words. His words spoken to others. His words muttered to himself. He knows even each and every thought. The most beautiful and high and lofty. And the most tainted and corrupt. In this prayer, David acknowledges that there's no such thing as hiddenness. When it comes to God's complete Knowledge of him. This knowledge traces back even to the womb. Where God with great artistry and complexity. Knit him together. In his mother's womb. In this secret place. Before many mothers even know that they're mothers to be. The creator God is intricately creating. God's works are wonderful. Every human is fearfully and wonderfully made. Even in utero, God is aware of and creating our unformed body. But apparently, David says, it goes even beyond the womb. It goes, it goes to this place before he even existed. That God somehow preordained his life. That even there, God knew him fully. One commentator simply said that God was not just creating life. He was creating a life. And if this was true for David, so it is true for you. God is not simply sitting in some heavenly palace somewhere, a figurehead detached from the grit and dirt realities of your everyday life. Quite the contrary. He certainly is on his throne, but he also knows all. He knows every move, every detail, and he cares about even the smallest of details. 
We used to have a stupid stray cat that would come around our house. And I, I used to wonder, does God care if I'm kind or cruel to this cat? <laughs> And I had a lesson to learn because I do think it's like, even I has, had these moments, like I have to choose, like, Cat, get away, I don't want, you know. Or do I show kindness? Do maybe I give some shelter? Do I? And, I, and it was like this lesson for me to say, man, God is keenly aware of every detail, of every cruelty, of every kindness. We might say that God is detailed-oriented to the infinite degree. But not in a way that we should think that God is just some vast computer collecting data, right? Good data, bad data. No, instead, his knowledge is incredibly intimate, personal, relational. David, at one point in the psalm, attempts to consider God's thoughts. And it seems like in the language that he may even be saying just thoughts concerning him, concerning David. And he's like, even that is too vast. I can't imagine it. I can't comprehend it. Even God's thoughts concerning me, one in seven plus billion alive on the earth right now, and he experiences the personal touches of God, his trustworthy hand of guidance and security. So as I've said before, God's word is very clear in this. You are not a random accident. You are not a meaningless, meaningless speck of dust floating in the cosmos. God's word says the opposite. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You were on God's mind before you were you. And you are always within God's complete and amazingly personal knowledge every second of every day. God made you and knows you better than you know yourself. And within that knowledge, when you think about that, that can become quite unsettling. Within that knowledge, God still says, I love you. I love you. This knowledge is so intimate that some Bible scholars see in this um, prayer that David's first instinct may be to flee, <laughs> to run away. And maybe you feel that urge. Maybe you even hear about that, that intricate, intimate knowledge, good, bad, ugly, highs, lows, and you're like, all right, uh, maybe I'll take off. We can think of Adam and Eve hiding in the garden, shameful of their sin and nakedness. Or Peter, it always strikes me this moment that Peter, Jesus does this miraculous work over creation and this miraculous catch of fish and and. Guys are probably amazed and at all and pulling things in and laughing. And Peter's response is he goes to Jesus and says, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. But if this knowledge is in one sense unsettling, it's in another sense a great assurance. And it very much depends on your posture before God. Michael Wilcock again writes, so long as I am looking to my own self-pleasing and away from God, I shall feel his overwhelming knowledge as a threat. As soon as I turn from my sin and back to him, it becomes a comfort. But David soon becomes aware that just as he cannot escape God's knowing eye, nor is there anything, any such thing as being away from the Lord's actual presence, his physical presence, his spiritual presence. For there is nowhere that God is not. And he gives these beautiful poetic descriptions that, that speak of the extremes that he could possibly go and maybe even couldn't possibly go. 
I'll go as far as I can north, as far as I can south, as far as I can east, as far as I can west. As I'll go to the highest mountain. I'll go to the center of the earth. I'll go into the valleys. I'll, I'll go into the light. Maybe I need to go into the darkness. If I find myself in the hospital... If I find myself in a red light district in a city, if I find myself at a church or I find myself at a bar, if I'm aware, I realize God is already there. You say, just ask Jonah. Not only does God know all things, but he inhabits all of space. David's like, even when I'm sleeping, even when I'm not conscious, even when I'm at my most vulnerable state, I know you're there for when I awake, you're still with me. Some people see in this, David possibly even alluding to the sleep of death, that even on the other side of that final sleep of the the mortal body, there God will be. Yet as terrifying as the fact that there is no escaping God may be, David also perceives that God's presence is just what he needs most. God is not only all-knowing and all-present, but he is the one who is working his will and his sovereign plan wherever he is. If his presence extends everywhere, then so does his sovereignty, his power, his goodness, his justice, and his love. Even when it's hard to see in this broken world. And just as this was true for David, so it is true for you. On your best day and on your worst. Whether you're fulfilling your dreams or you're doing household chores, or washing the dishes, or scrubbing the floors. When it's in happy times, or in mourning, clarity or confusion, health or suffering, God's promise will always hold true to his people. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. In the end, it's really fascinating David moves so far, if if it is this inclination, at least for a moment, to flee from God, he moves so far from that, that in the end, he is welcoming the most intimate process of searching from God, of being, having this prayer that God would search him out, that he, he, he now goes from like, where can I flee? Where can I go? To Lord, I am completely exposed from you. There's nowhere I can go that you're not. There's no place I can escape your eye, your knowledge, your presence. So as I stand before you, naked and exposed, search me. David wants God's loving scrutiny To reveal all that which is offensive to God. That God may rid him of all such things. And lead him in his way. This way everlasting. And suddenly we see under that knowledge and that eye and that presence. That David also realizes that he's safe there. That he can safely say to God. Test me. And show me myself. Show me even my shortcomings that I would learn more and more and more to follow your way of life. And so David shows through prayer how one can marvel at the realities of God and then be personally transformed by those very realities. And so may it be for us. I'm going to direct our our minds now and our hearts just to the communion, to the bread that represents Jesus' broken body and the cup, the juice that represents his blood. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn our attention back and reread verses 19 through 21. David says, If only you would slay the wicked, O God. 
Away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, O God, and abhor those who rise up against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Boy, that should be a worship song, shouldn't it? That seems harsh, David. To many, this, this, this part of this psalm, and, and there's other psalms like this, where David is, is singing the loftiest of praise and then all of a sudden directs what seems like this, this anger, this animosity towards his enemies. It's a stark shift. And, it, and for some, it's a, it's a dramatic contrast and maybe even distressingly so. As, as David says, God, won't you slay the wicked? In view of God's immensity and perfection, his creativity and sovereignty and care, David is stirred when he thinks of that which is evil. When he thinks of that which stands in opposition to God, he longs for there to be a resolve to this evil in light of God's goodness that it finally be done away with. And to David, it seems like the best solution is that God would slay the evildoers. You say, that does sound harsh maybe, but don't you have some of, that own long, uh, some of that longing in your own heart? That longing for justice, that evil would finally be vanquished, that all would finally be made right. Now, there's something of God in that desire. Though how people have focused that energy is often far from God's heart. And even more difficult in that desire is when you say, search me, O God, and know me. Test me. And suddenly you realize and come face to face with the wickedness that resides in your own heart. Realizing that at a very real level, you too are among the wicked, the rebels, the broken. So the New Testament would both harness and transform this passion against evil and make all things right in the person of Jesus. But shockingly, instead of God slaying the wicked, God became a man and was slayed by, and even more amazingly, slayed for the wicked. On the cross, Jesus would take on his innocent body and soul all the wickedness of the world. That the wicked, the rebels, the sinners, all of us included, would have opportunity to repent and to find forgiveness, to be saved and reconciled to God and slowly transformed into the likeness of his son. And for the sinners who will receive his sacrifice as personally theirs by faith, they will find that this all-knowing, all-present creator God is a God from whose love in Christ they can never escape. The all-knowing, the all-present God says, you will never escape my love in Christ. That when you turn to him and you become his, There is no place that you can go, no circumstance that you will be under, that his love will not be with you. What shall we say then in response to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. 
how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ, who died, more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I invite you to come and celebrate this love. This reality in which God truly slayed evil in an innocent man, Jesus Christ. That evil resided in you. And through Jesus, his death and his resurrection, God has made a way To make it right. And he will one day. Consummate that. And make all things right. On his return. And until that time. We have this season. Where we simply remember. And praise his name. For his conquering of evil. But his conquering of evil. Evil. In us. For his reconciling us. Back to the father. Knowing us, being present with us, rescuing us forever.